welcome everyone to this Thursday's Matter talk. I'm Maya and I'll be your host for today. Thursday's Matter is a virtual weekly meetup welcoming experts from around the globe to explore a wide range of topics that touch on software development and the tech industry as a whole. Today's edition is co-organised by Codurance and presented by James Burney. James is a principal consultant at Codurance, where he encourages positive business transformation through software excellence and a focus on outcome-driven cross-functional teams. Codurance is a global software consultancy founded on software craftsmanship and agile principles. They deliver valuable quality software for their clients and help them sustain better ways of working through skills transfer and positive cultural change. Codurance also built a free to use tool called the Compass which assesses the maturity of your software development organization and provides a report with recommendations for improvement. I will share links for Codurance and the Compass later on in the chat. So now, without further ado, we're delighted to introduce James Burney, who will be talking about post-quantum cryptography, why it is important and what it might look like. Over to you, James. Uh, thank you very much. So this is post-quantum cryptography apocalypse. It's obviously a clickbait title. I've used it before. I, I road tested this uh, a few times at different places and it turns out this is the best title. So hopefully a few people uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, very briefly, who am I? I've been a consultant for 10 or 12 years now. Before that, I worked in a startup for nine or 10 years. Um, before that was prehistory, back when we talked a lot about TDD but never did it. Um, I have face blindness, which is great because uh, it means these online conferences are better for me because I don't have to uh, work out who people are. Um, and uh, yeah, my involvement in quantum computing very much as a hobbyist, although I have seen real quantum computers and I've done a lot of research. And hopefully, I'm hoping there'll be some business opportunities in, in the coming years. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, Cryptography, what is it, what are quantum computers, and then a bit more detail about uh, why we should care about it right now. So, before I start, here's, here's a quick history lesson. Now, normally, um, we start with a pub quiz. Um, normally, I'll ask for people to shout answers out, but that's not possible now, so I'll just uh, pretend that people are shouting the wrong answers out. Um, I'm kind of guessing that no one's got any idea who these three gentlemen are, although often people guess Rivesh, Shamir, and Edelman. Um, they're not Ravesh, Shamir and Edelman. They are uh, James Ellis, Malcolm Williamson and Clifford Cox. We'll come back to those people later. Oh, and, and I do apologize for the distinct lack of diversity in the, the following slides. Uh, next, who are these two gentlemen? Um, more people know who these guys are. They're, it's, a, it's guessable. Um, they are uh, Diffie and Hellman, uh, the first people that showed uh, a paper on um, public key exchange. And finally, these three people, and I think you've got the hang by now, these actually are Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. And these three gentlemen gave their name to the RSA algorithm that we uh, still use for most of the world's encryption today. We'll come back to those gentlemen later. So, what is encryption all about? Well, uh, I'm hoping most people are familiar with encryption. Uh, but when we talk about encryption, uh, we're always discussing the situation where Alice is trying to send a message to Bob. And the evil eavesdropper, Eve, is trying to intercept the message. She's trying to listen to the message. However, there is one nuance that it's worth pointing out, which we come back to later, which is that it's absolutely useless for Eve to listen to the message unless Alice and Bob don't know she listened to the message. And that's an important point that's been borne out by history. If we look at, uh, in particular, the Second World War, when most of the Axis codes were cracked by the Allies, uh, there was always a conversation on reading their messages as to whether the allies could act on those on that intelligence or not because if if it turned out that the germans in particular knew that their codes were broken well then they would come up with uh, a new way of encrypting their messages so it's always important in the discussion about cryptography that uh, eve manages to listen to the message without alice and bob knowing she listened public key cryptography is what we we all rely on today Essentially, it's, it's a mathematical thing. Um, to, in order to encrypt a message, uh, you need to find something that is easy to do in one direction, but very difficult to do in the reverse direction. The classic, which is essentially what RSA relies on, is multiplying together two large prime numbers. 
It's very easy to multiply two large prime numbers, but it's very difficult to factorize a large, a large product of two primes. Uh, it sounds quite easy to do, but um, if you've studied this problem, you'll know it's, it's, of, it's actually sub-exponential complexity. The, the best factorization algorithms are effectively intractable. Uh, what that means in reality is that uh, the current keys that we use um, in most algorithms are 2048-bit keys. Um, if you, the biggest supercomputers in the world um, will take a, in the region of about 40 years to crack those keys. Uh, if you make a 3,000-bit key, if it were possible to make a computer that used every electron in the universe as a computational bit, it would take longer than the lifetime of the universe for that computer to factorize uh, a 3,048-bit number. So, sorry, 3,072-bit. So, it's fair to say that 3K keys are pretty much unbreakable. They're, they're safe from attack from classical computers. But there's this thing that's coming on, that's the, the subject of the talk, which is quantum computers. So what is a quantum computer? Now, I can't explain it fully in the time available, but hopefully I can give everybody enough of a feeling for what they are. So uh, in order to understand uh, a quantum computer, it's first, I'll just review what a, a classical computer is. And I've got this quote from Max Planck saying, science advances one funeral at a time. One funeral at a time. It's actually a paraphrasing of a quote because he first said it in German, as far as I'm aware. Um, but the meaning of the quote is this. What I want people to be able to do when they listen to a talk such as this is to set aside some of what they think they know. Um, because in order to take on certain new ideas that are so alien, you have to kind of uh, set things aside, set aside what you think you know. And when we start looking at quantum physics and quantum computers, I think that's quite important. And what Max Planck was saying back in, I think, uh, the early part of the 20th century was um, every time your views are challenged uh, as a scientist, you resist that change. Uh, so science only advances one funeral at a time. And what he's saying is that it's very hard to persuade people to change their views. So in effect, during his lifetime, at least, you had to wait until the older generation one by one moved on. Uh, and, and that's the meaning of his quote. So... What is a classical computer? Well, a classical computer consists of bits, which is um, a zero or a one. That's obviously an abstraction. Uh, most classical computers hold zeros and ones uh, as, as a difference in voltage. Um, and those zeros and ones get passed around inside the computer through things called logic gates. Uh, the picture on the left is a very simple um, description of an OR gate. And what's going on there is, is if either the A gate is closed or the B gate is closed, which is equivalent to a zero or a one in, in uh, either position, the bulb comes on. If they're both switched off, the bulb doesn't come on. And that's effectively an implementation of an OR gate. The picture on the right hand side, um, each of the shapes um, below the top bit uh, with the lines going in and out of them, they represent different logic gates. Uh, I can't remember exactly which ones. Um, and all together, what you can see going on there is a flow of bits from left to right, from top to bottom, through those different logic gates and an answer coming out on the right-hand side. And what that is a representation of is floating point arithmetic in a 16-bit computer. So what that's doing is it's using clever combinations of logic gates to do some mathematical operation which is more complex. That is effectively all digital computers, classical computers can do. They can do it incredibly quickly and they can do it with very high fidelity. Um, in fact, the fidelity is so high, one can assume they don't make errors, um, but that's effectively all they do. So it's, they sum together literally millions and billions of these operations to do useful stuff, um, to do the things that we understand that um, classical computers do. On the other hand, uh, a quantum computer is a bit different. So it has a thing in it called a qubit um, which is essentially the quantum an analogy analog of, uh, of a bit. Um, just like a bit in a classical computer, if you observe the value, it will be either zero or one. However, before you observe the value, in general, it will be holding both the values zero and one simultaneously. What that, that's called superposition. Uh, what that means is that you can do some very powerful computations if you can take advantage of this property. So you could have a register of, say, eight qubits together, each of which is in superposition. You can perform a calculation on that 8-bit that number, 
and the, class, the quantum computer will simultaneously perform the calculation on every value from zero up to 512 or from one to 512, depending on how you treat the most significant bit. Um, and that's superposition and that is essentially um, the main reason or one of the reasons why quantum computers get a lot of power. Um, the, the state, the quantum state uh, is being held in superposition and if anybody is familiar with quantum physics, I won't go into it too deeply, but this is effectively an abstraction of the quantum state. The sphere on the right hand side called the block sphere represents a qubit. Uh, the arrow, uh, the point on the sphere is the quantum state, which is represented by the little toasting fork Greek letter, which I think is called Psi, I can never remember. Um, that can be on any point on the surface of the sphere. If that is pointing straight up in this representation, the value of the qubit when measured will be zero. If it's pointing straight down, the value of the qubit when measured will be one. If it's pointing anywhere else on the sphere, when you observe the value of the qubit, it might be zero or it might be one, depending on some probabilistic calculation of whether it's near a zero or near a one. However, before you observe the value of the qubit, if you use that qubit in a calculation, it will use both zero and one in the calculation. As I say, it's in superposition. That's kind of all we need to know for this talk. The mathematics is pretty complex and clearly I don't have time to explain it, but I'm hoping that I can give you a flavor of, of exactly how things work. So, just like in a classical computer, a quantum computer has a notion of gates, logic gates through which the qubits themselves are passed. And these gates, uh, much as they do in a, in a classical computer, they act on the quantum state of the qubit and they transform it to something different. Um, and that's how it works. So a, a gate-based quantum computer, which is what I'm talking about for this talk, is essentially the, the sum of lots of quantum states going through lots of gates, and then you can observe the, the result at the end. So, in order to understand where the power comes from, I need to talk a little bit about some concepts that come up in physics, uh, in quantum physics, which is superposition and interference. So I've mentioned superposition briefly already, uh, but now I'm gonna mention interference again. And I'm going to illustrate an experiment by way of showing you a nice video, or at least I hope it's a nice video. Okay, so here we go. The three of us have been trying to reproduce the double slit experiment. So this is Ben, this is James, and I'm James as well. We've used equipment that you can find anywhere. Well, 3D printer maybe. Yep. Wow. Down here, we made a frame and a holder for our double slit. We made the double slit by using a sharp knife in between some tin foil. Here we have a laser pointer. It's the same laser pointer that I'm going to be using during the presentation. So who knows, I might even reproduce it if I've got this equipment, but it'll probably end up in a bin later. Down this end, we've got 3D models of Ben. We've got Big Ben and medium sized Ben. Little Ben we left on the table over there somewhere. And they're holding our screen to receive the results. So let's see if we can make a diffraction, uh, an interference pattern at the other end of this desk. Very scientifically done this, and uh, there it is. Can we see the interference pattern? And that is quantum physics in action, as demonstrated for you in the ThoughtWorks office. Thank you very much. Okay. So well, that's perfect for a second. Oh, yeah, you get a really good shot of it. <laughs> I didn't edit the video. My colleague Ben at the time edited the video. So what we're seeing there is an interference pattern. Now, what is the significance of that? Well, I will explain. So, that's effectively a picture of what's going on. Uh, this experiment, I think, was first carried out in 1830. Now, prior to 1830, um, most people, well, physicists, uh, believed that light traveled as particles. Uh, this went back to Sir Isaac Newton's time, and Newton had postulated that there were particles that he called corpuscles that carried light from the light source to uh, where it was going. Uh, a growing number of physicists at the start of the 19th century um, felt that this wasn't true, and they felt that light traveled in waves. 
and Young's devised the, Young devised the double slit experiment as a way to demonstrate that. And he thought that if he could set up an interference pattern by forcing light to go through two slits, then it would prove that it traveled in waves. And what we saw in the experiment there was the very bright patches were where the, the light waves were interfering positively, the peaks met the other peaks and it, in, it enhanced the light. And then the dark patches in that pattern are where the peaks of one wave intersected with a trough of another wave and they cancel each other out. And uh, that's a classic wave interference pattern. So from that point forward, the world accepted, okay, Newton was wrong, light travels in waves. And everybody was happy for a while. Until it turned out that uh, uh, Einstein showed that light isn't propagated by particles. Sorry, isn't propagated by waves. It's actually propagated by particles. And he proved this um, with a very, uh, actually quite a simple experiment, but um, I can't remember exactly how it went, so I can't describe it. And he called these particles photons. And um, that presented a problem to the world of physics because Young's double slit experiment shows us that interference takes place between uh, light as it travels. So particles don't interfere with one another. So what's going on? Well, what they decided was the physicists decided, okay, uh, it must be, let's invent something called wave particle duality. So what they said was photons, well, yes, they're particles. Um, they have momentum, so they're particles, but they also share the properties of some waves. So they called this wave particle duality, um, which I believe is still taught as a thing in schools. Um, I've never found that to be a particularly satisfactory explanation. It, it, it feels a bit sort of made up and contrived. Um, but then in any case, in the middle of the 20th century, things moved on again. Because it became possible to devise the double slit experiment, but to, to, to do it in such a way that the source of light can emit one photon at a time. And you could guarantee that between the thing emitting the photon and the thing receiving the photon, that there was only ever one photon in flight at any given point. So of course, when that experiment was run, people expected that you would just see the photons going straight through and, and hitting the screen in the background, probably in two thick lines where they went through either of the slits. But that isn't what you saw. What was seen was if you run the thing over time, and that's what we're seeing on this slide, they still form the interference pattern. They just do it dot by dot by dot. So what that means is, well, they're, they're suffering some kind of interference, even though each photon is flying through the air and it's guaranteed to be the only photon in flight at the time from start to end of the journey, it's still being interfered with by something. So this presented a problem to everybody because now in order to have interference, you need something to interfere with. So this, the astonishing explanation, and this is where I ask people to suspend their disbelief, uh, was first proposed by a scientist called Wheeler, and it's called the many worlds interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. The most plausible explanation that I've come across for this phenomenon that we see is that each different path that the photon may take, and there are a finite number of paths that the photon may take, because despite what you might think, space is not continuous. So uh, however thin that gap is in, in each slit, there will be a finite number of different ways the photon can go through with it. So you multiply the two together, that's the number of different paths the photon can take. Um, each of those different paths happens in a parallel universe. We can only see one path in our universe and that we observe by where it hits the screen behind it. But what's going on and the reason why we get the interference pattern is that all of those ghost photons, the photons that are taking a different path in a different universe, they are all interfering with one another. And that's why we see an interference pattern. And that's why we see the similar interference pattern when they're traveling seemingly on their own, on their own as when we fire a beam of light with, with photons traveling simultaneously. We'll come back to those parallel universes later. I'm just gonna throw this in very quickly. There is something, if anybody on the call has ever studied digital signal processing, they may have heard of a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform is something that you do in, in classical computers, and essentially it's used to compress uh, sound signals, uh, I believe, I'm not an expert in it. And what it effectively does is transform the time domain, so a time signal doing that, a wave signal doing that, 
converts it to the frequency domain. So if something has a frequency which is regular, you'll just see a straight line. And that's, it's used in compression algorithms uh, to, to transfer uh, digital signals. Um, the quantum Fourier transform is a similar thing. Um, what it does is it can take advantage of the interference pattern between the photons and it transforms the time domain into the frequency domain. And effectively, it's exploiting superposition in and interference. Um, I find it very hard to understand this fully, what it's doing, and I certainly can't explain it in, in the time available. Uh, but suffice it to say that the quantum Fourier transform underpins many, many algorithms that we're proposing now will be those, the things that make a, a quantum computer really useful. Let's move on. Now, this is the, the elephant in the many quantum rooms. We can talk a lot about what quantum computers will be useful for, in particular chemistry. Um, and I, I have to mention the, uh, the Harbour process, the Harbour-Bosch process, which is how we derive all of the world's fertiliser, or most of the world's fertiliser, ammonium for fertiliser. It currently takes uh, 3 to 5% of the world's natural gas to make all of that fertiliser. And that's because we don't understand the chemistry to a sufficient level of detail of how organic chemi chemicals work in bean plants. Um, but quantum computers are promising a way around that because quantum computers will be able to simulate uh, that high level, well, actually really low, low level chemistry that goes on in organic, com organic compounds. And that's the really exciting promise of quantum computers. And there are other useful uses for it. But what's the elephant in the quantum room? Well, it's cryptography. Now, this is a picture of Peter Shaw. And uh, you may have heard of Shaw's algorithm. Uh, sometimes when I give this talk, it's in the heading of the talk, but it's not on this occasion. Now, what's Shaw's algorithm? Shaw's algorithm is an algorithm to factorize large numbers. And if you remember at the start of this discussion, I talked about how encryption relies on the fact that it is hard to factorize large numbers. So what is Shaw's algorithm? It is a uh, quantum algorithm. It's an algorithm designed to run on quantum computers. Um, what does it look like? I'm going to run through it very quickly because it's quite counterintuitive. Um, we're trying to factorize this large number n, whatever that un number is. Um, the way to do it, which is very counterintuitive, pick any number less than n, check that a isn't a factor of n. Yeah, it's vanishingly unlikely that it will be if n is large. Um, then we use the quantum period finding routine to find the period of r of a to the x mod n. It will become clear what this means in a moment. Um, go back to step one, then you can actually factorize n uh, a to the x minus one and a to the x plus one. What I'll do is I'll show you by way of a piece of, of a demonstration. So let's say I'm trying to factorize 15. I choose a random number less than 15. So let's say I choose two. Um, two doesn't divide 15. So we move on to the next step. Now we need to find the period of two to the x mod 15. Now what that means is, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, 2 to the power 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 15. That's modular arithmetic. You might remember that from university if you studied maths or from school even. I can't remember when I studied it. So if you continue to raise 2 to successive powers, modulo 15, it goes 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. 1, 2, 4, 8. So what that tells us is that uh, the period of 2 uh, with respect to 15 is 4. Now, there's a very simple uh, piece of algebra that tells us that what that means is 2 squared minus 1 multiplied by 2 squared plus 1 equals 1 mod 15, which if we expand that out tells us that 2 squared minus 1 gives us a factor. 2 squared is 4 minus 1 is 3. 2 squared plus 1 gives us the other factor. So 2 squared plus 1 is 5. And hey presto, we've factorized 15. Obviously, that's uh, a trivial example. Uh, when I first started looking at Shaw's algorithm, I thought, okay, I need to understand the complexity and I need to think about this in terms of some bigger numbers. So me being me, being a sort of uh, typical person that programs computers, I decided to start a spreadsheet and work it out this way. So happily, I still have that spreadsheet, which I'm now going to show you. Here it is. This is the fruits of my labor on one journey into London one day. I hope everybody could see those numbers. Do I need to make that bigger or are they readable there? Just looking. Thank you. Okay. 
So what I thought was, okay, I'm going to choose a sort of medium large number. I'm going to choose 1,517, which I happen to know is the product of two um, prime numbers. So I started off by choosing four. So four squared is 16, four cubed is 64, and so on and so on. Obviously, at some point, this number overflows in column C. So in column D, I'm taking that number modulo 1,517. And if we scroll down this page, what we'll find eventually, it goes, it returns to one. And that tells us that the period of four with respect to 1,517 is 90. Great. So what that further tells us is that four to the 45 plus one and four to the 45 minus one will give us the factors of 1,517. So I need to go back and find four to the power 45, but unfortunately, that number is way too big for Google Sheets and it overflowed ages ago. So I couldn't quite do the maths and work it out. So that was no good to me. So naturally I thought, well, you know what, four, maybe that's a clue, I'll try 16. So I tried 16 and what did I get from 16? Well, this time the, the period was 45. And unfortunately that doesn't help me because it needs to be an even number because I need to do four to the 42 and a half. That's no good because it needs to be an integer. So. 16 was no good. Then I tried five and what did I get from five? You can see by this stage, I'd added column F with true or false in it to make it easier to find where it repeated. Oh, let's scroll down. And unfortunately it's 180. So that's too big of a number. But this, at this point, I noticed that there was a pattern with 45s and 90s and 80s, which I'm told has some mathematics behind it, but I've never had a chance to study it properly. So unfortunately, I don't know why those periods are multiples of each other. Eventually, I went through and through, and if I remember rightly, I tried 10. And wonderful. I noticed that it repeats here, and the number hasn't overflowed. So I'm like, great. And I, oh, unfortunately, again, it's an odd number. It's 15. So that was no good to me. And eventually, I managed to find this number, 14. Brilliant. 14 to the power 24 is 1 mod 1517, but more importantly, 14 to the power 12 is a real integer that enables me to actually run through the rest of the calculation and verify that this algorithm actually works. So, what did I do? Uh, how do I get this out of the way like that? So, back to my presentation. Uh, here we go. And I will show you the workings. So, we're factorizing 1,517, we chose 10, and that was no good because its period was 15. Then we chose 14, obviously I'm missing out all those other steps. Period of 14 mod x is 1,500, uh, sorry, is 14 to the x mod 1,517 is 24. 14 to the power 12 minus one is this massive number here that begins five, six, six, nine and ends in five. That is a multiple of 37, which tells us that 37 is a factor of 1,517. And 14 to the 12 plus one is effectively another big number, which is two bigger than the other big number. And that is a multiple of 41. What does that tell us? And you can do this calculation on your calculator. 37 times 41 is 1,517. And those are the factors. We factorize 1,517 using Shaw's algorithm. Well, we've kind of simulated Shaw's algorithm on a classical computer. Now, here's the thing. Where's, where's the magic in all of that? You can see from that spreadsheet that I just showed you that that is a fantastically complex calculation. It involved a lot of trial and error. It involved going through, looking at all those numbers, raising them to successive powers. And obviously 1,517, well, that's, that's only an 11-bit number. And we're talking about 3,000 bit numbers that we want to factorize. So you can see that that gets more complex. Well, um, where, where's the magic in all this? What, what is Shaw's algorithm doing? Well, the magic piece is step number four. Use the quantum period finding routine. Now, if I may just return very quickly to my spreadsheet. Why is that important? Well, if we look again at this spreadsheet, we can see all these hugely complex numbers. And I've just picked on a, a sheet in random. This one is 23. We can see the period is 60. You've got all of these intermediate calculations that are hugely complicated. 
But actually, we don't care about those calculations. We don't care about the big numbers in column C. We actually don't even care about the numbers in column D. The only number we care about is the one down here. And it's not this one, this one, or this one. It's this number. We care about the period of the function. That's the only significant number that helps us find the factors. So what Peter Shaw's great insight was to do was to say, OK, we don't actually care about all those calculations. If there's a way to exploit the parallelism of, of a quantum computer to get that quantum computation to carry out all of those calculations in parallel, and we can just discover the periodicity of that function, then that's all we need to know. So what he managed to do was to come up with an algorithm that takes advantage of the quantum Fourier transform, which as I say, and this is a gross oversimplification, uh, converts uh, the time domain into the period, into the, um, uh, oh God, I can't remember what it's called. It converts it to the time domain into the frequency domain, thank you. That effectively will tell us the periodicity of any function. So it's not quite as simple as that. There's a few more steps that I'm glossing over. But what Peter Shaw realized is that all of those calculations, we don't care about the actual values. They can take place in parallel universes. We'll only ever be able to observe one of those calculations. However, if we do the quantum Fourier transform, we can see the periodicity with ever accessing the values of those intermediate calculations. That's the great insight and that's where the power comes from and that's what most quantum algorithms do. They exploit somehow the interference between all the qubits and the superposition to give us a result which will obliquely tell us the real result that we're looking for. And the fascinating thing in complexity theory is this, the quantum period finding routine is exponential complexity with respect to the size of the number. What that means is that it brings that whole calculation of factorization into the realms of being intractable for a classical computer. It now becomes tractable, it becomes solvable for a quantum computer, which is quite scary. What that means is if we could build a quantum computer big enough um, that was reliable enough, we can break all the world's encryption. If you're interested in checking out uh, the implementation of Shaw's algorithm, my implementation is on my GitHub page. There's an address there. If you want to take a screenshot, please do so right now. Um, if you want to see a better implementation, then my old, my ex-colleague Andrew that I worked with for a while on this, uh, his GitHub, which is on this slide, uh, his implementation is better than mine. Uh, although the classical bit of the algorithm steps, the bits that don't include the quantum period routine, I think mine are better. But, you know, take, take your pick, you can combine the two. So is RSA dead? Do we need to be scared about our computers and all our encryption um, going dead? Well, Shaw's algorithm requires a vast number of qubits. So for a 3,000-bit key, you're going to need, uh, well, for a 2,000-bit key, you're going to need 6,000. For a 3,000-bit key, you're going to need 9,000. Um, the biggest known computers at the moment, this is slightly old information, have in the region of 100 qubits. So we're a long way off being able to factorize numbers big enough to break encryption. Google recently claimed quantum supremacy. Uh, I could probably get rid of the word recently in this paragraph now. Um, it's over a year ago now. They claimed quantum supremacy. What that means is they believe that they found an algorithm that is solvable more quickly and more efficiently in a quantum computer. That has been challenged. But when somebody can prove quantum supremacy, I think we'll see uh, the power of quantum computers increasing rapidly because then they'll become commercially viable. If RSA dies, there are ways around it, and I'm going to quickly show you one of them. Uh, there are quantum-safe classical algorithms. Uh, there's some examples of them. BB84 is 100% safe. It is a quantum key distribution mechanism, uh, which I'm going to demonstrate now. Uh, we could use BB84 if we had networks big enough. It's slightly impractical at the moment, but it is being used. Um, so what this is what we need to do uh, now and later when Shaw's algorithm kills all our encryption. So, as I've said, there are classical algorithms that are quantum safe. My understanding is that they're not in wide use at the moment because it slows the performance. So, things like Google are reluctant to put these into Chrome, uh, into the SSL um, uh, protocols because it will slow performance down. That's understandable. We don't need them yet, um, but they are there. They could be used. Now, why did Amazon send me all this packaging? Well, I'll show you by way of my second visit to the cinema, um, which is 
here we go. We're going? Yeah, we're going. Right, I'm James. Today, we're going to do another quantum experiment. This time, we're going to talk about polarisation of light photons. Here, here, we've got my daughter Felicity. Here. And here, we've got my daughter Clementine. Hello. Okay, and outside, what have we got? We've got the cat. <laughs> that is... Definitely very that is Clementine's cat, and as you can see, she wants to get inside. Maybe. Girls, does one of you want to empty this box out just to show Amazon's packaging? And what was it they sent us through the post? Well, it was these three tiny pieces of um, polarizing light filter. Okay, now let's run our experiment. Girls, you take one. Clementine, take another. So you take those. Take, take, take them over to the window. Okay, so now the girls have got the three light filters. Clementine's got two, and Felicity's got one. Okay, so now Clementine, if you hold one light filter up to the light, that's it, that's good. Now, uh, hold it so that it's facing right towards me, so it's flat towards me, that's good. Okay, now, bring the other light filter up, Clementine. And that's it. Now, they're at right angles to each other, and you can see that where they overlap, no light is getting through. If you just rotate it around again, so it's the other way around, Clem, you can see that when they're in the same orientation, it still lets half the light through. So now, if you put them together the other way around, that's it, hold them tightly against one another, that's it. No light is getting through. One of the filters is stopping all the light, the other filter's stopping the other, all the, the rest of the light. Now, firstly, get the other filter and hold it in front, so it's touching. You can see still nothing's coming through the two filters that are touching. And on the back, please. Okay, still nothing comes through the two filters. Now, slip it in between the two filters. That's it. Brilliant. Now, hold. Now twist it. Twist it towards you. Twist it towards you and, and make sure they're tight at the top. Hold it there. Fantastic. Now you can see what's happening. Where there's one filter, some of the light stopped. Where there's three filters, some of the light stopped. Where there's only two filters, all of the light is stopped. Um, well, as I say, one filter stops half the light. Two filters at right angles stop all the light. Introduce a third filter in between, and suddenly some more light gets through. Why? Well, uh, it's because light is polarized. Light, those photons we talked about earlier, have an orientation. Each of those Polaroid filters stops 50% of the light, but with the light it lets through, it twists the orientation. This goes back to what I said about observing the value of a quantum system. If you look at the value, it definitely has a zero or a one. So once that half of the light gets through the filter, it's now exactly oriented all vertically. So when I introduce the second filter at right angles, no light can get through. But what about when the third filter comes in? Again, if we start from this picture and we introduce a third filter in between, a first filter stops half the light, but it's oriented vertically. Second filter comes in at this 45 degree angle. Now, half of those original photons that got through will get through again because they're at 45 degrees. So randomly half will go through, but they're now oriented at 45 degrees. So now when they hit the third filter, they're no longer at right angles. So half of them will get through. And that's why we see 12.5% of the light getting through when the third filter is introduced. So this property of light was seized upon by two scientists called Bennett and Brassard. They thought that they could send, using horizontal and vertical photons, an encrypted key over a channel. And this is the clever part. So they agree between them that um, if they look like this, the photons, that means a zero and that means a one. If they look diagonal, then that means a zero and that means a one, simple. You then send the key. You must choose a key that is longer than the length of the message and you randomly choose whether to send it diagonally or vertical and horizontally. So Alice sends the key based on the orientation, the basis that she chooses. Bob then randomly chooses a basis and measures the key. Now you can see from this picture that half the time, Bob randomly chose the correct basis to measure by and he got the right result. The other half the time he chose the wrong basis and he will effectively get a random result. So far so good. Why is that useful? Well, because 
they can compare the keys. What they do is now Alice tells Bob what basis was used at each, uh, at each step. She says, Alice says, um, this is the basis I used. And what they do now, they can do that on a public channel because they now can compare the results they got. Bob and Alice can share, can check a prearranged piece of the key. Because if somebody was listening in the intermediate, if Eve intercepted any one of those qubits, she, like Bob, any one of those photons, sorry, she didn't know whether to read it like that or like that. So 50% of them she'll read correctly. The other 50%, she won't only not necessarily read them right, she'll disturb them. So Alice and Bob can now communicate on an open channel and say, okay, the first 10 bits of the key are 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on. All they have to do is compare it. And if they agree, if, if Bob's reading matches what Alice sent, they know that nobody interfered with the key. If they're different, they carry on sending the key until it's not listened to. And in that way, you can't guarantee that you're not eavesdropped, but you, you just keep sending the key until it's not eavesdropped. That means it's provably secure. Because if Eve was listening, she'd have introduced the errors. You just send the key again until the key is not intercepted. And BB84 is therefore provably secure. And that is currently in use. There are various QKD networks in the world. Uh, China, there's a Chinese satellite that is relaying QKD keys. Um, you have to trust the satellite though, so I'm not sure we trust the Chinese. So that is a provably secure way of exchanging messages. Um, there is a consortium in the UK, and this is a picture of what they're doing, uh, which is attempting to use BT's fiber optic network to, to do quantum key distribution. Uh, their record at the moment is about 40 kilometers of fiber optic uh, cable, which is actually what's on that desk there. That, believe it or not, there's about 40 kilometers of cable on that desk. And the message, the key is it's being exchanged between the two um, racky computer things you can see. So that is... Um, the future of uh, encryption. Uh, I hope everybody followed that. And I'm just going to finish with a quick lesson. Go back to those gentlemen at the start. So why should we be scared about Shaw's algorithm, given that uh, we can make secure communications and we can do it now? Well, Diffie and Hellman published their paper in 1976. That's what we know about uh, public key exchange. Rivesh, Shimer and Edelman published their algorithm in 1977 and they patented it um, in the US. So as far as we know, that's when public key encryption was invented. But remember those other three chaps. In 1997, James Ellis, Clifford Cox and Malcolm Williamson, our government, the UK government announced they had come up with an RSA algorithm long before RSA was published. Several years earlier is the official word. Now we don't know exactly when that was earlier. So why should we care about that? Well, we know now that um, the uh, various intelligence services all over the world are actually listening to all our messages right now that we're sending with RSA. They can't decrypt those messages right now, but what they're gambling on is that in the future, those messages, they will be able to decrypt them because RSA, the, the message doesn't decay over time. So anything that you send now, if you care about it being not readable five, 10 years from now, you should care about post-quantum cryptography. If it's a financial transaction, if it's something that loses its value in five minutes or five days, who cares? But if it's really secret stuff you don't want shared, you don't want people eavesdropping on you five, 10 years from now, then I think we all need to start considering post-quantum cryptography right now. So thanks very much for listening. Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you very much for sharing your talk. Um, if you'd like to leave your page with recommended reading up, that'd be great because then people can note it down. And we have one question which has been posed into the Q&A box. Okay, so uh, Matthew asks, why are we not using quantum safe encryption already? It is simply because of performance. Uh, my understanding is, uh, and I had this conversation with uh, the colleague that I mentioned earlier that helped me to uh, understand Shaw's algorithm, uh, something like ring learning with errors, it uses a polynomial of big numbers rather than just a single big number. And that imposes performance constraints. And at the moment, the view of most people building software is that that is an unnecessary performance constraint. It will slow things down too much. So it's simply a matter of performance. Okay. Should I move on to the next questions or? Okay. 
Uh, okay, this is a good question. Um, other than breaking the world's cryptography, what things might quantum computing be used for? Uh, great question. I mentioned earlier chemistry. Um, that's the big promise. Um, organic molecules are too complex for uh, classical computers to simulate accurately. Um, uh, there are various reasons and techniques around this, but I, I'm told that the most complex molecule that we can truly understand is caffeine. Now, what that means is that when we design drugs, for example, what the um, drug companies do is take chemical compounds that they know worked in a similar way in the past and they make a similar compound. But then they have to experiment um, somehow with that compound to see if it does what they want it to do. Now, in organic chemistry, and I'm not an organic chemist, so I apologize if I get this slightly wrong, but the exact chemical properties of a complex organic compound are not just dependent on the, on the atoms that are within each molecule. They're dependent on the angles of the bonds between the various atoms and, and how close the atoms are to the other atoms and all sorts of, of really um, complex things like that. Any molecule will find something called a ground state, which will then, it will fall down into that ground state and uh, that will be the lowest energy state and, and that determines its chemical properties. We cannot simulate that in a classical computer. They're not powerful enough. But what we can do in quantum computers is actually use the qubits to represent those different atoms and those different interactions. So effectively, it's not simulating the behavior within the molecule, it's, it's actually replicating the behavior within the molecule. And in that way, we can hopefully understand organic chemistry much better, which will help with drugs, um, drug research. It will help with, um, as I say, like uh, synthesizing chemicals, the, the biggest one being ammonia for the world's fertilizer. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, shall I move on to the next question? Next question is, um, why are intelligence agencies storing RSA encrypted traffic that they can't currently read? Um, the answer to that is for the same reason why they've always harvested messages uh, throughout history. Uh, go back to my example of the war. Um, we were keeping all of the, the access messages before we knew how to decrypt them because we might get useful information later. So um, I think they're probably only really concerned with messages that are going between, uh, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted between probably terrorist groups. Um, but I'm, my guess is that each of the world's intelligence agencies are snooping on each of the other intelligence agencies' traffic. And if it's RSA encrypted, they're hoping that one day they'll be able to get something valuable from it. Okay. Uh, next question from Rob, running an Internet of Things software platform, an IoT device company asked us to support this encryption that is weaker than web standards. How do you feel about security algorithms possibly getting worse as IoT rolls out? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that sounds quite scary to me. Uh, I mean, anything below a thousand bit encryption is, uh, or thousand bit or below is, is very vulnerable. So. Uh, I'm not an encryption expert. I don't know how important IoT things are, but I guess something that scared me was the recent breach for um, Garmin systems where they, uh, they were taken over by um, uh, ransomware uh, because Garmin systems are, are helping to control aircraft as far as, uh, as I'm, I'm aware, but I'm not an expert. I, um, yeah, it, it scares me that IoT may, may make encryption standards go back backwards. Okay. Okay. Next question from Phil. Are elliptic curve algorithms quantum safe? My understanding, Phil, is that elliptic curve, as it's currently um, used in, in server technology, uh, I think you're more of an expert on this than I am because I know who you are, um, are not quantum safe. However, there is something called super singular elliptic curves, which is a bit like RLWE versus RSA. It's a polynomial-ish version of those elliptic curves, a similar type of implementation and, and maths and implementation, and that is believed to be quantum safe. Okay, uh, Matthew Riviere, okay, is asking, are there any quantum computers that I can use? Okay, Matthew, the answer to that is yes. Um, for quite some time, IBM have had public quantum computers. Uh, if you Google IBM Q experience, um, they have two five qubit computers that have been available to use for some time. Uh, one of my slides earlier that had the pictorial representation of quantum gates, that's taken from IBM Q experience. Um, 
You can use, there's a graphical editor to program those computers. And there's also, it supports a sort of Python dialect scripting language. I can't remember what they're called, they called it. Um, that you can submit programs to it. You can either use their simulator to simulate running your program, or you can book time on the real quantum computers. If you set up an account, uh, I haven't looked at it for uh, some time, to be honest, um, but it used to be that you could get a free number of credits, uh, which enables you to join the queue. Um, I actually was involved, uh, coming up for a couple of years ago now, in a live hack day um, in London, where IBM gave us access to their bigger 20 qubit computer and we did we ran some quantum chemistry algorithms um, so yet yeah, they exist um, I've got a photograph of myself in front of one of them and you can use them also AWS have now got a version a quantum computer um, that you can actually use uh, through your AWS account uh, so we'll finish with then somebody is asking I've heard of something called quantum supremacy what does this mean uh, that's a great question because that's the tipping point like the what that basically means is um, it is a real world problem or a real world class of problems that can be solved more efficiently on a real quantum computer than on a classical computer. Um, as soon as such a class of problems exists, so as soon as the quantum technology is good enough, as soon as the quantum computing technology is good enough, and as soon as our understanding of how to program is, is sufficiently good enough, then somebody will claim quantum supremacy. As I mentioned earlier, Google claimed this some time ago, but that's under dispute. Uh, my understanding is that um, we haven't got to quantum supremacy yet. But the reason why it's significant is that if somebody proves quantum supremacy, um, then uh, another area of research will really be opened up, which is people are using quantum computers to uh, simulate financial markets. Uh, banks are already investing a lot of money in that. And once quantum supremacy is, is demonstrated, I think that investment will just take off. And just like the big money institutions like banks uh, and big business fueled the, you know, the exponential uh, growth in power of, of classical computers in the 80s and the 90s, I guess, uh, once banks start investing you know, hundreds of millions of, of uh, dollars and pounds and cents and euros, uh, I think we'll see um, an exponential move towards useful quantum computers. Uh, I can't tell you when that will be, though, but um, quantum supremacy is important to that. Okay. Terrific. Thank you so much.